Hi again, everyone. So here we are, laboring on this fine day of labor, as one does. Um, so this will get us pretty much through all of the vector space material today, apart from the cross product. So that'll be all chapter one. Um, like I said, we're doing the chapter one material in <clears throat> a good deal more detail than, um, than the textbook is. And the rest of the course will follow the textbook a good deal more closely. The, um, <clears throat> the reasoning behind this is really just that the textbook is sort of built based on the assumption that you've had a graduate level course in algebra, where at Penn State we typically have not at this point in, you know, an engineering graduate program. So the only thing in chapter one that we won't have addressed by the end of today's lecture is the cross product. <clears throat> and my rationale behind that, when we get to tensors, um, I believe the cross product is pretty intrinsically related to second order tensors and the notion of skew symmetry. So we'll get to the cross product after we get to skew symmetric tensors in probably the you know fourth or fifth lecture so today we're going to talk about the inner product and orthogonality which are two things that you've probably heard before and are quite familiar with and the reciprocal basis which is a way of describing the dual basis of an inner product space relative to vectors in the original space um, which you probably haven't heard of before <clears throat> so let's start out by defining the inner product in maybe more formal mathematical terms. Um, this would be a useful exercise, and it should also show how it ties into the inner product that you've already learned in your undergraduate course material. So for a real vector space V, this is a real one as opposed to a vector space over the complex numbers. An inner product is an operation that takes two vectors as arguments <coughs> and returns a real number. And we will denote the inner product with a dot. So in terms of mathematical functional notation, we would say this dot maps V by V, so lists of two elements from V to the real numbers. An inner product is defined by three properties. The first is symmetry. So A dot B is equal to B dot A for all A and B in our vector space. The second <clears throat> is that it's linear 
in the first argument. Um, in fact, it's linear in both arguments. But if you combine symmetry and linearity in the first argument, you'll get that it has to also be linear in the second argument. And mathematicians like to define things as minimally as possible. So we have And so what that says is that um, alpha A plus beta B, <coughs> all dot C, is equal to alpha times A dot C plus beta times B dot C for all real numbers alpha and beta. That's a bad symbol there, isn't it? And for all A, B, and C in our vector space. The third <coughs> is positive definiteness. And so that is a dot a is greater than or equal to scalar 0 for all vectors a in our vector space. And a dot a is equal to scalar 0. This is a implies that going both ways. So the the double line with an arrow one way would be implies that and the double arrow the other way is also implies that. So a dot a equals scalar zero if and only if vector a is equal to vector zero. <coughs> so in other words if a dot a is equal to 0, then a has to be equal to vector 0. And vector 0 dotted with itself equals scalar 0. Um, if we were talking about a complex vector space instead of a real one, the only real difference would be that this symmetry here becomes conjugate symmetry. Um, other than that, everything is applicable. The inner product induces a norm, so notion of length, on a vector space V. And that's going to look like this. So we can say that the norm of a vector v is defined as where it's an inner product space. The, uh, the square root of v dot v for all v in our inner product space. So now we ask the question, what is a norm? And you, know, you already know, um, but in the same 
sense as we wanted to come up with a <coughs> graduate level mathematics definition of what it means for something to be an inner product. Let's say what it means for something to be a norm. So a norm is an operation that will denote with double bars like this, and it takes one argument. Get out of here, B. I'm telling you, these freaking bees, it's like they're fine all summer. It gets chilly out, and they are really something out here. Having one of those fool me once sort of moments, if you remember the last lecture. Oh, well. All right, so it maps the vector space v to the real numbers and it satisfies three properties uh, some people will break the first one into two but I don't really see any reason to so the first one is it's positive definite So that is that the norm of a vector x is greater than or equal to 0 for all x in the vector space. And the norm of x is equal to 0 implies that <coughs> vector x is equal to vector zero. So the implies that going both ways is the same as if and only if, which um, some people will abbreviate IFF. Um, and I might do that sometimes if I forget that I'm using this notation for it instead. Um, I'll try to be consistent with it, but know that those are two options for writing the same thing. The first is that you can move a scalar outside of the norm as long as you take its absolute value. So two is that the norm of alpha x is equal to the absolute value of alpha times the norm of x for all real numbers alpha and for all vectors x. And the third is the triangle inequality, which basically means that the norm of a plus b can not be any bigger than the norm of a plus the norm of b. That is so, of course, Euclidean space that we're used to has a vector space, you know, and we're talking about three-dimensional Euclidean space, which we almost always are, then it's a three-dimensional vector space describing which ways you can go in it. Um, but Euclidean space has an inner product on its vectors, so any three-dimensional vector space we encounter <coughs> is always going to have an inner product, pretty much, and that inner product is always going to induce a norm on it, a notion of length. Um, but there are a number of useful vector spaces that you run into in the course of 
solving these boundary value problems that we'll construct especially where the vector space might have a norm, but it won't have an inner product. So in general, a norm is a much more common thing to have than an inner product. Pretty much any useful vector space has a norm, a notion of length. Um, and it's important for being able to like distinguish one vector from another. It makes a vector space into what's called a metric space. And like pretty much any useful mathematical theorem requires a metric space, but inner products are pretty special. Um, so the most common example of a normed vector space that is not an inner product space that you'll encounter is probably the LP spaces, which I'll describe in a, a minute here. We'll write that down though. All right, so that's L superscript P. Um, what does the L mean here, right? The first thing here is the L stands for Lebe integrable, um, which is to say things that can be integrated. And so this is all just so that when you're <clears throat> dealing with, um, you know, fancy math papers on subjects, you'll be able to decipher what they're talking about. And if you go to conferences and talk about stuff, you won't make yourselves look like fools in front of mathy people. Um, so you got to know their lingo. Um, Mathematician-y people really like this notion of integration called LeBay integration which is like a Riemann sum, except that you make the sum on the target space instead of the source space. And it allows you to integrate a bunch of functions that are like discontinuous everywhere or, you know, zero almost everywhere that you wouldn't normally be able to integrate with a Riemann sum. Um, they're by and large, pretty useless for us. So the distinction between LeBay and Riemann integration is immaterial for people doing engineering problems. But that's where the L comes from here, is it's LeBay integrable functions. <coughs> and um, so LP of some domain omega is defined as the set of functions F which map omega to real numbers such that the integral over omega of the absolute value of f raised to the p power um, one exists but two is less than infinity. <clears throat> um, and you'll run into this. So, you know, continuous functions on some bounded region form a vector space. So do integrable ones and everything. So these are a vector space. Um, but the only time that, so they have a, a natural norm. That's not the pencil. We'll call it the 
like that. Um, so the only time that this norm is compatible with the idea of an inner product is when p equals 2. But the LP spaces turn out to be pretty useful when you're talking about solving the boundary value problems that arise from the theories that will develop here. So if you wanted to set up the boundary value problem and solve for stress, strain, displacements, velocities, and all that, um, solution existence and uniqueness and how you get to them, things like that all come from LP space theory. Um, and, you know, often P is equal to 2, and you're able to talk about an inner product. But also often P can be equal to 1, which would be just integrable things where their square is not necessarily integrable. And the other one would be P equals infinity, which is the bounded functions norm, or the maximum value over any set of finite measure, basically. Um, and it ends up mattering. When, when you go to talk about the solutions to the boundary value problems. But we're not really going to be solving the boundary value problems in this class. We're just going to set it up. Um, but, you know, you ought to be aware of it and know the lingo. Other lingo. A normed vector space. The math people will call it a Banach space. And an inner product space. <clears throat> will be called a Hilbert space. Um, and technically, the inner product one applies to <coughs> finite and infinite dimensional ones, but often math people talk about Hilbert space only in terms of infinite dimensional ones, so like continuous functions or square integrable ones, things like that. Um, but that'll, you know, if you're surfing Wikipedia looking for things, these will be probably what you'll look at. Um, if you search for these, you'll probably eventually end up at things on that, but these will give you closer to what we're talking about, and these might give you closer to undergraduate sorts of results. <clears throat> All right, so given that lingo, um, of course, an inner product introduces an idea of orthogonality. So two vectors are called orthogonal if their inner product is zero. And we'll denote that A is perpendicular to B. <clears throat> A consequence of this is that zero is perpendicular to every vector, including itself. Since we have an idea of orthogonality, um, we also have an idea of the angle between two vectors that falls out of the existence of this inner product. <clears throat> 
All right, so any two vectors in a vector space are always going to be coplanar. And so if you think about Euclidean geometry as you're used to it, um, in a plane, there are two angles between two lines. There's an interior and an exterior angle. Um, so we're defining the angle. Once you put the cosine there, it doesn't matter whether you think about the interior or the exterior. So we'll just say that the angle between them is given by cosine theta is equal to a dot b <coughs> over magnitude of a times the magnitude of b. And you can decide whether you're interested in the interior or the exterior angle theta when you go to you know actually calculate the angle so we're really just giving the cosine of the angle in terms of the dot product or inner product <coughs> so the inner product also implies the existence of orthonormal basis bases So an inner product means there is such thing as an orthonormal basis. And I'm going to denote elements of orthonormal bases as something special. So they'll have a little hat over them. EI hat. What in tarnation is that slamming? Just the wind. Oh, okay. I going from 1 to N. <clears throat> is, you know, a basis, but it additionally satisfies the orthonormality constraint, which would be that EI dot EJ is equal to delta ij. So this handles both the fact that they are of unit length, since if i equals i, then that equals 1. <coughs> or rather, if i equals j, that equals 1. Um, but also, the, uh, the, the normality part, you know, that if i is not equal to j, then that's 0. So these orthonormal bases... Why is it doing that? There we go. They're pretty super duper useful um, because we can do in components what you're used to doing when you go to take the inner products of things. Let's say that we express vectors in terms of their components relative to any old basis. say that's just f i. All right, well, we have vector a is equal to a i 
fi, and let's say that b is equal to b i f i. Well, a dot b <coughs> is equal to a i f i dot, we can't reuse the i, b j f j. We can move the scalars however we want. So that is equal to a i b j times f i dot f j. All right, well, in general, that's about as far as we can go. But if the basis is orthonormal, then we can get to your uh, your typical inner product, dot product, components understanding of things. Um, so if f i the basis now is orthonormal. Then f di f i dot f j is delta i j. And you can say that a dot b is equal to a i b j delta i j. Well, zero unless i equals j. So we can throw away all the terms where i is not equal to j and say that that is equal to a i <coughs> b i. So when we have an orthonormal basis and we express vectors in components relative to the orthonormal basis, then the familiar multiply together and sum the scalar components formula. Oh, why did that flip over? Come back. For computing the inner product applies. Um, whereas if we have any old basis, it is not applicable. You need to have the inner product of the uh, the basis vectors as well. So you just have a i b j f i dot f j and that would be as far as you can go. Now you know an orthonormal basis is a special thing but given an inner product space we can always construct one. So while they're special they're kind of easy to come by in a sense. So given any basis We'll call them f i. We can construct an orthonormal basis using the Graham Schmidt process. call that EI with a hat. So the first step is E hat one is equal to one over the norm of F one times f1 and then 2 
E2 is equal to F2 minus F2 dot E1 times E1 all over the norm of that. And we know that that's not zero because <coughs> the, um, the Fs are a basis, you know, so this top part isn't zero, so its norm isn't zero, so this is a well-defined process. And that would, you know, continue, so on. So E3, you'd take F3 and project it into the direction that's perpendicular to F1 and F2, and then rescale it by its norm, etc., until you run out of vectors in F to create more ease. All right, so next we're going to talk about the dual space of an inner product space. Um, we had said before that given a vector space, they all have a dual. And, uh, you know, if the vector space is finite dimensional, then they have the same dimensions. But without the inner products, we can't really say anything. We can't, like, draw dual vectors. You know, we can't draw covectors as it was, or, like, give a picture of what they are turns out that given an inner product, we can. So let's say we have a vector space equipped with an inner product, this is a Hilbert space, and we pick some arbitrary vector in it. Then, if we define this function, oopsies, we don't want that there, f sub v acting on u is defined as v dot u for all u in our vector space. <coughs> well, clearly, fv maps the vector space v to r. So it's a functional. And um, since the inner product is linear in both arguments, it's a linear functional. <coughs> So it's a member of the dual space to V. So we've just figured out a way of, for every vector V in our vector space, um, making an element of the dual space. Well, since the dual space is itself a vector space, um, and if V is finite dimensional, then V star is equal to the dimension of the vector space. Then, um, you know, given any basis for V, we've just figured out a way of making 
a basis for V star. So, in fact, every member of the dual space can be described as just an inner product with a member of the original vector space. So, for an inner product space, Uh, this is, of course, no, this is true even for infinite dimensions. Um, we have that V star is equal to V. So we already had that V double star, the bi-dual space, can be naturally identified with the vector space V, as long as it's a normed vector space um, of finite dimension, <coughs> or if it's a reflexive one. But um, now we've shown for an inner product space that V and its dual can be identified with each other, which is pretty special. So that ties into the next useful subject, which is going to be the reciprocal basis. And this will be extra super useful when we talk about making tensors and finding their components relative to any old basis. So you probably remember from a couple lectures ago <coughs> that we had said that given any basis for a vector space V, there is a corresponding basis for V star, the dual space, that's called the dual basis that satisfies um, a property where, you know, EI, EJ is equal to delta IJ. So I'll write that out here. And so I'm using E here. Um, remember, I'll usually use E when I'm doing an orthonormal basis, but it's the hat that means it's orthonormal, not the choice of letter. So this is any old basis that we're calling E's, not necessarily orthonormal. And in fact, we're not using an inner product, so it's not going to matter. But I just figured I'd point it out. And uh, this stuff here, I think, is also chapter 13 does some good coverage of this in the textbook. So it'd be good to flip ahead and look at that. So there's a corresponding basis, E superscript I, for the dual space. So without an inner product, we can't really like draw covectors or give a visualization of what they are relative to vectors. So, you know, it's like these here, who knows what they are. Um, but we just showed that if we do have an inner product space, we can express all covectors in terms of vectors and really identify the two with one another. So, given any old basis, we can generate a reciprocal basis, which is also a basis for V, since we're identifying V with V star. But that reciprocal basis is going to be able to satisfy this. 
So here the reciprocal basis is denoted like the dual basis. And it's true that it is covectors. But it's going to be a vectors since v is equal to v star. <coughs> um, one consequence of this, when you have the inner product, it kind of puts some haziness to, anytime you use an inner product, it sort of puts some haziness to whether something should be a covariant or a contravariant index. Um, but we're going to say that satisfies... fi, the regular basis thing, dot fj, the reciprocal basis element, is equal to delta ij. <coughs> um, where now both f subscript and f superscript are elements of v. All right, so how are we going to calculate this reciprocal basis in components relative to the original basis? That's what we'd like to do, is say, given this, what do these look like expressed in components? Well, how do we, how do we find the F? superscript i, so the reciprocal basis, given the original basis. Well, let's let mm, this matrix G, and we'll put them as superscripts here for <coughs> perhaps sort of my own sanity. Um, but like I said, we sort of lose the distinction between covariant and contravariant when you use the inner product. Um, so this here is going to be related to the metric tensor. This is defined as, in fact, it is the metric tensor or metric, we'll just call it the metric for now. So fi.fj subscripts, so these are both the original basis. You know, we're not talking about the reciprocal one yet. This is just like we have the basis and we're generating this matrix of the inner products between matrix elements. All right, so then the definition of the matrix inverse, if we have G, I, K times G inverse kj, that is equal to delta ij, just by the definition of a matrix inverse. So this is not, you know, tensor, this is just matrix. We haven't talked about tensors yet. All right, so let's say, you know, we can express all of these reciprocal basis elements as linear combinations of the original basis elements. So we can make a matrix mapping one to the other. Um, so let's say, that this matrix B defines that correspondence. This is equal to B, J, K, F, K. Um, so here the superscript and subscript index gets kind of screwy. There should be a superscript there. Um, like I said, Let's not worry about it for now. So this superscript here is not any more to be understood as covariant, contravariant. This is just distinguishing the reciprocal basis <coughs> from the original basis that has subscripts. Um, if you really get curious about it, and hopefully you do, you can go to like the Wikipedia page on raising and lowering indices, and you see all sorts of neat stuff about metric tensors and be able to make sense of it. But for now, let's just think of the superscript not as meaning 
contravariant. We're just thinking of it as talking about the reciprocal basis versus the original basis um, within the context of the inner product. All right, so we just have this matrix here of the components of these relative to that basis. Um, all right, so from the definition of the reciprocal basis, we have, if I get the pen, F subscript I, so original basis element, dot F superscript J, so reciprocal basis element, is equal to delta I J. Again, don't pay too much heed to the covariant versus contravariant. In fact, just for consistency's sake, let's just put that down there. So again, this isn't meaning contravariant, although it is, um, but <coughs> the inner product kind of screws with the distinction between the two. All right, well, we kind of came up here with this way of expressing fj in terms of its components relative to fk, the original basis. So that is equal to fi dot bjk fk. All right, well, bjk there is not a, you know, tensor. It's just a matrix operation. So these are just a bunch of scalars. So they can move outside um, this whole thing, and we can just look at fi dot fk times bjk. So where'd that go in the notes here? It's on the next page. Look at that. We're on the last page of the notes. Aren't you guys lucky? All right. So, stop that. Delta i j is equal to f i dot b j k f k, where now these are both original basis elements. That's why they got the subscripts there. All right, well, in that case, We can also say that that is equal to B, J, K, F, I, dot, F, K. Well, that's the matrix G. Um, and because of the symmetry, we know that G has to be symmetric, right? The inner product is symmetric. F, I, dot, F, K is equal to F, K, dot, F, I. So the transpose of the matrix G is equal to the matrix G itself. Um, but we'll get there in a second. At any rate, delta i j is equal to b j k g i k, and we can change the order of that. It doesn't matter since the indices are uh, are what makes the you know matrix row ordering. Um, and not the order of the terms in this expression. So that is equal to G, I, K, B, J, K. All right, so we see in matrix form that this is equal to G, B transpose. the ijth element of it. So um, so B has to be equal to G inverse transpose. <coughs> now, since, since G is symmetric, G the matrix, We have that B is also equal to G inverse. Um, but I think that 
this one, you know, b is equal to g inverse transpose, really tells a better story because it gives you the idea of covariance and contravariance and how it plays into things. So, you know, we see under change of basis, the, um, the reciprocal basis is going to go as contravariant. So one special thing about orthonormal bases is that an orthonormal basis is its own reciprocal basis. All right, that's all we got for today with this. Um, and that, apart from the cross product that we're going to get to in a little bit, concludes our discussion of <coughs> vector spaces and vector algebra. Um, so we're going to get on to second order tensors and tensor algebra. Um, and that's going to be restricted to three dimensions. And then after that, we're in that going to talk about the cross product and then we'll move on to vector and tensor calculus. Hope you had a good Labor Day weekend. Um, we'll get another lecture out soon. Remember that the homework is due um, a week from today. And we're scheduled to have office hours tomorrow, Tuesday, but um, do email me if you want to do them. Um, and I haven't set up the zoom meeting yet so i'll try to find a way to do that um, if i hear back from any of you but kind of hoping that this first homework should be simple enough that hopefully no one needs to do office hours this week um all right catch you later <laughs>